Hey folks, it's Ray from DCRamerica.com here. Today I'm here to give you 15 things that you need to know about the new GoPro Fusion action camera. Now this action camera was announced mid last year and then it went ahead and actually started shipping back in November. You may remember my unboxing video linked up there uh, that I did on this as well as some other sample footage and stuff like that. Now that I've been using it for like two and a half, three months, I figure it's time to drop my full in-depth review which you can find down in the description down below there. But this video is all about like these random things that are kind of interesting to know, sort of geeky, but kind of important to know as well if you're looking at getting the GoPro Fusion. Uh, now the very first thing on the list is that it comes with this pole. Now that may sound silly at first to mention, but it's actually probably the most important thing about this action camera. See this pole is designed such that when it's fully extended like this, this pole disappears in the stitched frame, but only if it's oriented just like this where the camera is exactly uh, in line with the pole. So what happens is it's basically in between these two lenses, I'll talk about that in a second, which makes the pole disappear by time these two lenses are stitched at the base there. It's a really, really cool effect and something that you've seen a lot of other people use, uh, things like in skiing and cycling and lots of different activities where it looks like the camera's just simply hovering out in front of you, pretty darn nifty. Next, there is actually a front and back on this camera. So if we pull this back down again, you'll see there's two lenses, one here and one here. This lens, the one with the LCD screen, is considered the front. Um, now that matters for a few reasons. One is that when you're shooting video, you generally want the most interesting thing, 360 video that is, the most interesting thing to be facing the front camera to begin with. That's because on YouTube and other platforms, if you don't do any editing with the 360 video, just simply upload it, it's gonna default to that view. So if I have the front lens facing downwards right now, then the first thing people are gonna see is the ground. They may not know what to do. So instead you wanna point it at yourself or whatever is the most interesting thing in the frame, that way the people people can start with that. So at the very worst, if people don't move the screen around, then they're just gonna see something interesting. If they move the view around, then they'll go ahead and again see other cool stuff but definitely start with that front camera first. Next, we have over capture mode. Now you've heard a lot of talk about this and you've probably heard all the marketing speak about this, but what is it exactly? Well, essentially it allows you to take this 360 degree fusion footage that it captures and take a snippet out of the middle of it. Um, so that basically a 1080p snippet that looks like normal footage. Now, why is this interesting? Well, basically 360 degree footage by itself is kind of a pain in the butt to work with. Uh, and it's not something a lot of people like to view versus 1080p footage or basically non-spherical flat footage is something that a lot of people are very comfortable with. It works on all devices out there, TVs, all that kind of stuff that 360 degree footage doesn't really render as well on. But with a 360 degree view, you're capturing everything. So later on in post-production when I'm editing the video, I can take it just the snippet I want. It allows me to do pans through things, allows me to go ahead and change the angle. It's really kind of a powerful way to go ahead and grab just this part of the scene that I want that's most interesting and then using some of the options in Fusion Studio or in the Premiere plugins that I'll talk about in a bit I can go ahead and remove sort of that um, 360 degree look to it that bending look to it other camera companies have had this for a while whether it be Garmin or Fly360 or others this is all something that's kind of pretty much already there GoPro does a really good job of branding it. Next, it takes two SD cards, or technically two micro SD cards. You'll find them on this side right here under this little door, uh, SD card number one and SD card number two. These align to the lenses. So SD card number one, SD card number two. You have to have both SD cards in there. It's not a redundant system. It's not recording both cameras to both things. In reality, there's probably not a lot of reason GoPro needed to do this. This is more of a safety thing. If you look at Garmin's Verb Ultra 360 camera, um, that's actually shooting at 5.7K. It's probably really shooting at the exact same resolution as the Fusion here is. But in that case, it's doing it on a one SD card. Never really had any problems there. No one else I know has had problems either. But this is probably more of like a CYA thing than anything else. Still, two SD cards, important to note. Um, GoPro recommends fairly fast ones and I would agree with them, but you don't need to go completely overkill because it is only really shooting one 4K image to one lens at a time because these are basically two 4K camera lenses right there. By the way, free tip not included. Speaking of this door right here, one important thing is when you screw this thumb screw in, make sure you put it on the same side as the LCD screen. Otherwise, if you put it on this side, you can't open the battery door when you're out and about. Kind of a bummer. So speaking of storage, how much storage does this take? a lot. So if you're looking at one minute of recording, it's a roughly 1.3 to 1.35 gigabytes of space. How that's divided up? Well, there's a whole bunch of files this camera records every time you hit that record button. The first is each lens is of course recording a file. So for one minute, it's roughly 500 megs per lens for the main files. Then you're gonna get these um, preview files. So that's what you see when you lo load your phone or the desktop app. Those are roughly 20% of the total size of each lens. So you got two of those preview files, and then you have audio files and you have some of the junk files that don't really have any appreciable space. So all in you're looking at roughly 1.3, 1.35, maybe 1.4 gigs per minute. 
but that's even before we talk about stitching, which we'll get to in just a second. Next, let's talk about that battery. Now the good news is the battery is removable. So I can go take this out like this. It's a big old chunky battery. It's roughly the size of two GoPro Hero 5, Hero 6 black batteries, just squished together into one big battery. You can buy extra batteries. They're not too expensive in the grand scheme of GoPro batteries. Um, you know, GoPro does tend to overcharge for the batteries, but uh, this isn't that bad given how big it is. From a time standpoint, you're looking roughly at 60, 70 minutes of straight recording, depending on what other things you got enabled. So things like GPS and Wi-Fi cut into that battery time a little bit, but not a ton, to be honest. Your biggest challenge is really over here heating on this thing, uh, especially in a warm environment like I am right now. Overheating is what's gonna probably kill you first before battery life. So you may be asking, can you plug it in if you don't have enough battery life to record something long form? Yes, you can go ahead and open this little door right there and that actually falls off by the way, it comes off. Uh, and right there you can put a USB-C cable in and plug it into a wall outlet and keep this thing recording the entire time. Once again though, overheating tends to be your issue. Some folks have a good luck by going ahead and popping the battery out though to give it a little more air while it's plugged in uh, and that'll help reduce some of the overheating. Next, like GoPro's Hero 5 and now Hero 6 cameras, it supports voice controls, which means I can say GoPro, start recording. And it starts recording. GoPro, stop recording and it stops recording. Same thing for taking a photo as well. It's super handy, especially in a 360 camera, when you have it like out on something like this and you wanna go ahead and just be like, GoPro, start recording. And it starts. That's pretty helpful. GoPro, stop recording. Keep in mind though, if it's really windy out or you've got a lot of speed, you're probably not gonna be able to make this thing trigger. You can use the remote if you'd like that will pair with the Fusion camera, but sometimes it's just easier to simply press the button on this if you're within range of it anyways. Next, Fusion supports the GoPro app. It's the same existing app that you've had for all the other existing cameras. Uh, it's just the GoPro app itself. It allows you to connect to the GoPro Fusion camera and look at the footage on the camera as well as to see a preview it. You can also download clips on it, but there's a lot of limitations. First off, you can't do over capture with it. Over capture the ability to go ahead and basically take a snippet out of uh, the camera itself. So you basically get a 1080p non-spherical, non-360 degree snippet out of the 360 degree video. Um, so just like a normal YouTube video at that point or a normal video. So you can't do that on the mobile phone, only on the desktop software. Also, it's a lot lower resolution that you'd see on the desktop software. Um, so it's great for like quick on the go type stuff, but it's not that good for any sort of editing. Uh, you can't edit with it in here either. Uh, it's just simply grabbing clips and snippets. It's, it's really kind of basic. So instead, the tool that you're gonna be using, both loving and hating, probably more hating, is GoPro Fusion Studio. That is a desktop tool available for both Mac and PC, and it's what ultimately takes the two files that you generate, one from each lens, squishes them together, and makes a 360 degree video. Remember, when this camera records, it is not recording a 360 degree single file like a lot of other cameras do. For example, Garmin's Verb 360 or the Fly 360 cameras, those cameras actually produce a single file that you can literally take straight off the SD card and go right up to YouTube and have it be 360 degree content. In the case of GoPro Fusion, you have to run it through Fusion Studio first. That software will go ahead and take the files from these two SD cards squish them together and then spit them out. You have a couple different options there depending on what resolution you want. You can go 4K, you can go 5.2K, you can go straight to Facebook or YouTube. Um, it's all kind of based on what's most optimized for that particular platform. If you're planning on editing it later on in something like Adobe Premiere or Final Cut Pro, you're gonna wanna go much higher resolution, maybe use ProRes or Cineform um, as opposed to a simple 4K uh, H.264 export. Now, one of the coolest things to be aware of is the stabilization. Um, the Fusion camera supports stabilization in post-production, which means that it uses all of the accelerometers inside of this unit itself to keep the footage beautiful gimbal stable. So there is no need for a gimbal on this like you might have on a traditional action camera. Instead, in post-production in Fusion Studio, you would select which stabilization you option you want. Um, one of them is more about following kind of the direction of the camera, and one of them is about keeping the camera stable itself. Uh, and in my case, I usually use the full stabilization option because I'm doing most of my editing in post-production. If you're going ahead and maybe not doing that, you might want to look at the other option instead. But in my case, full stabilization, which makes everything look just buttery smooth no matter how bumpy the ground is. Perhaps out of this entire list, the most important thing to know is just how darn long it's gonna take for you to export that footage. Um, it's a really, really long time. It is by far the slowest 360 camera I've tried out of everything I've tried in that kind of consumer uh, realm, you know, under $1,000. Uh, to export footage from this thing, uh, meaning that you're exporting the two files, sticking together, running them out as a single stitched file, you're looking at between 20 and 45 minutes per minute of footage. And that's a 
best case scenario. Um, so if you have 10 minutes of footage, you're talking a lot of hours, like probably four to eight hours a time to export that footage out, assuming GoPro Fusion Studio doesn't crash, which it more than likely probably will along the way because that's how awesome an app it is. Uh, so that's something you have to keep in mind. Your best bet on, from an editing workflow standpoint is to go ahead and figure out the clips that you need, get them all lined up in Fusion Studio, add to the render queue, and then just go to bed um, or go out for a really long day of running or riding or whatever it is that you do uh, because that's how long it's gonna take for this thing to export. Bit of a workflow pro tip for Fusion. When you're doing all that copying back and forth or importing a footage, don't actually do it with this plug straight into your computer. Instead, pop the SD cards out, put them in an SD card reader and copy the footage to your computer or something direct attached to your computer with high speed data rates. That'll save you significant time when it comes to that rendering process. And the reason is the way Fusion Studio works in all of its glory is that it's basically round tripping this stuff from the camera back to the hard drive, back and forth three times in the entire process. So every time it does that, it takes forever to do all that work. It's much, much faster for you to go ahead and copy this content straight into folders on your computer, copy all the files, not just like the main two video files, all the files into folders like GoPro front, GoPro back, and then let Fusion Studio do its thing from there locally. It'll save you a boatload of time. And once it's done exporting, the files are pretty darn big too. Um, you're looking at about four and a half gigs per minute of uh, ProRes quality export files. So that's for 5.7K, by the way. Um, so pretty sizable files. If you're doing something like 4K footage, uh, H.264, so basically the lowest option that you have there, you're only looking at about a gig per minute, so not as bad. So now that you've got that footage out, GoPro has plugins available. In particular, they've got plugins available for Adobe Premiere and Adobe After Effects, which means that you can take the footage into those applications and do a bit more massaging with it in terms of changing the view, the yaw angle, the tilt, all that kind of stuff to create the perfect view. And that's whether you're shooting in 360 or within overcapture mode. It's within this plugin that you can go ahead and do things like zooming in and out of that tiny planet look that you people really seem to love and you see a lot of videos out there. It's also how you can kind of straighten things out in different footage depending on how the camera is oriented. So so it's super, super useful plugins. The downside though is it's not available for Final Cut Pro and it doesn't sound there's any plans to either. GoPro tweeted out just two weeks ago, they have no plans, no development timeline at all, nothing in the works for Final Cut Pro. Now there are some native tools in Final Cut 10.4 which came out back in December, but the problem is there's still some missing pieces there that GoPro has on their plugins in Premiere that they don't have in Final Cut Pro. For example, you can't go ahead and zoom in and out of movements on Final Cut Pro like you can on Premiere. You can do keyframing in Final Cut Pro, but it's not quite the same thing. You can't go ahead and get that in and out of Tiny Planet without doing just a gazillion different keyframes. You also don't have a smooth transition option like you do in Premiere that's part of the GoPro plugin that sort of just makes it a little more cinematic looking uh, than just doing a standard keyframe. So it's really a bummer GoPro's not doing that. I suspect the reason that if you look at GoPro's editing team, the one that create those awesome videos every year that launch the GoPro's launch videos, they're all Premiere editors, and I guess they just don't simply care about Final Cut. So that's definitely a huge gap. I mean, it's really, really a big gap if you are a Final Cut editor. Now, the next thing to know is that this exports out in 5.2K once things are all rendered but not really. If you upload it to YouTube, for example, you'll notice it actually doesn't show 5.2K, which is kind of funny. Um, so YouTube, in this case, basically tops out below this. It shows it as like 4K footage, whereas if I export something out of the Garmin Verb uh, 360 camera, it shows it as that full 5.7K, or just simply says 5K on YouTube, and it shows the actual resolution right next to it. It's a bit of a bummer. I've talked to GoPro about it, and they kind of like just sort of shrug their hands, or like, eh, Sorry? So it's a little weird. I'm not sure why that is. It's something obviously on the YouTube side that they don't recognize that as being legit 5K footage. Um, it may just be right underneath their thresholds there or whatever the case is, uh, but just something to be aware of when you see it uploaded. Even GoPro's own videos on Fusion don't show us 5K. Another downside to be aware of is that these lenses are not swappable. So unlike a Hero 5 or Hero 6 action camera, if you were to break that lens, you can go buy a new one and pop it in place and life is grand. Here you have to call GoPro support and basically get the camera swapped out. So these things do not pop off, they don't do anything, they are stuck there permanently. On the bright side, this thing is fully waterproofed. It's fully waterproof to five meters or basically 16 feet. So you can dunk it down in the water, you can take it underwater, do whatever you want, get those cool shots. 
and you're good to go without any other sort of case required. Anyways, there you go. A whole pile of tips on GoPro Fusion, things that you might need to know. Definitely check out my full in-depth review in the description there. I have links to sample footage. I've got you know test data. All that kind of stuff is in there as to how well this thing really works in real life usage. So for me personally, I tend to use a GoPro Hero 6 Black most of the time or a Garmin Verb Ultra 30 if I'm doing something more that's data focused. But with this, I'm gonna use it for things that I may not have the exact angle I want up front and I can get that over capture angle later on. It does shoot beautiful 360 footage and I do love the fact that I can get rid of that pole, it just happens automatically. Um, but again, it's really the over capture piece that's actually more interesting to me than the 360 degree footage. Also, it's pretty bulky, so it's not something that like doesn't look really great on top of my head on the helmet. You gotta wear it on some sort of pole or use it on some sort of pole uh, in order to get the most from it. But overall, it's really impressive. Anyways, thanks for watching. If you found this useful, whack that like button bottom there as well as the subscribe button. I appreciate it. Have a good one.